Well, let's look at these things, histograms and polygons. They're the two most common ways of visually representing the, the data. A histogram, remember, is like a column graph. So when you construct your histogram, things to keep in mind. Every column is centered on the actual score itself. So the score sits in the middle of the column. Sometimes these values are known as the bins. So you might see that term, the bins. The columns we join up without a gap so something like that. There's a frequency histogram of our, our pet example that we did. A cumulative frequency one, then you would add the frequencies as you go along so you should see it rising. Those columns will, will rise as you go up. The polygon is like the line graph. Our rules. You plot the points at the center of each column. And that's why it's important to center the column on the number. So that way, that point is directly above the, the number. Okay. So there's our pet example. I would plot at the center of each of those columns. But you start and finish it at where the next bin would be. So we don't have one for five. Technically, the frequency is zero. So we would join it up to zero. And I know it sounds crazy, but negative one would have a frequency of zero as well. We would join that up as well. And then that would be our frequency polygon. Now, the reason why we join these up all has to do with the area under the curve. And we'll, we'll see that when we look a bit more into stats. That actually there is a direct relationship between this, if we could work out the function of this line, and the probability of, of things happening. And that's why we need to have these two points drawn in to get the complete area under the curve. With a cumulative frequency polygon, that one you start at the bottom left of the first column. Then you join the diagonal and then you just keep going to the top right of each column and that gets you the cumulative frequency polygon also known as the ogive. That, that's what they're talking about, the, the cumulative frequency polygon. What happens when you group data together? Because sometimes you've got so many different scores, it's not practical to find the frequency of every individual score. You've just got too much information. So you group it together. You group the discrete pieces into a class or an interval. So how to do it? They've got to be inclusive and not overlap. You, it can't be possible for a score to go in two different groups. Uh, each score is only in one and only one class. So for that reason, you may have to make a decision what you're going to do with a score that's on the boundary. Now, it doesn't matter what you do, you just have to be consistent. Right. So if you decide that it's always going to go in the lower class, then it's in the lower class for all of them or if it's in the upper class. And usually when you're doing a presentation of your data, you would let people know that this is how I handled scores on the boundary. So they know, right, that's how the stats has been dealt with. How many classes are you gonna use? Generally, yeah, five and 10, somewhere in between there. So that then will tell you how wide you're gonna make each class. Pretty simple formula, really the range divided by however many intervals you've decided to, to have. Um, now, with, with width, number of intervals, well, hang on, round up number of intervals. But anyway, well, width, you should always round up when you get that answer. Whatever the number is, just always round up. And that's how many we're going to use, and that's the width that we'll, we'll use. Now, when you do your calculations, though, you assume every score has the value of whatever the center of that data is the class center that every piece of data takes on that value and the reason behind that I guess is they think well some will be above some will be below so well we'll just say it's the middle one and, and we'll use that so we can do calculations heights in centimeters 300 students we went out and measured their heights and we placed them into these classes and we decided to go 10 centimeters so we're gonna use a frequency distribution table. We're gonna find the mean. It won't be a median now, it'll be a median class. It'll be a modal class. We'll find the variance and we'll find the standard deviation as well. So here it is in our distribution table. But you'll notice the value I've put up the top here is the center of each of those classes. So 125, 135, that's what I'm assuming every piece of data is. So now I can work out FX, average, 
Well, that will be the sum of fx, but in this case, it'll be divided by n because I'm using frequencies here instead of probabilities. Remember last year when we did it, we had probabilities there. Here, I'm just using the frequencies. So that's why I've got to divide it by n as well. Uh, 156.5 comes out to be our average. You'll notice I've used x bar rather than mu. Now, technically, when you're dealing with a sample, you use x bar to mean average. When you're dealing with a population, you use mu. Now let's work out our variance. Same deal. When you're dealing with samples, you use s. When we were dealing with a population, that's when we used... It's a baby sigma. <laughs> okay. Again, notice I'm dividing the sum by n for the same reason. And I'll subtract the average square. Remember our formula to find variance. Subbing in, we get 262.75. The deviation, you remember, is the square root of variance. So we get 16.21. Ah, we want to find all these other things. I'm going to need a cumulative frequency. So there's my cumulative frequency distribution. The mean we worked out, 156.5. There it is. The median class, that's where cumulative frequency comes in handy. I end up in the class. It's the one where the class center was 150. So the actual class was 150 to 160. The modal class also tends to be 150 to 160 here. So both of them are giving us the same measure for the center. Variance we found out was 262.75. Deviation was 16.21. But here's how you can use the OGIVE to calculate the actual median itself. There's our cumulative frequency polygon drawer in the OGIVE. There it is. The median height will correspond to a cumulative frequency of 50%, which in this case will be 150. So if I draw a line across and go down, well, it's telling me it's in that class, but is it 155? It might not necessarily be 155. Where is it falling down there? Okay, so if we just look at this piece of the OGIVE, so that we're going from 99 to 199, we're stopping at 150. Our question is, where did we land down here between 150 and 160 somewhere? Where is it? We can just use similar figures here to work this out. There it is. Median we 150 plus 150 minus 99 over 100 times 10. Where did that all come from? Well, 150 is where we're starting from, so we know it's going to be 150 plus something. 150 minus 99. So vertically, I'm going that far. But the height difference is 100. Well, if I times that by 10, why 10? Because that's how wide the actual one is. Then that gives me 155.1. It was very close to 155, but not quite. So, you know, we wouldn't have been far off if we'd said 155. 15B.